this special overview and tutorial video of Asset Forge was brought to you by these awesome patrons. Thank you so much for your support. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. I am Amalgam Ash, and today I want to show you Asset Forge, a 3D kit bashing tool made by Kenny. Kenny, otherwise known as the god of assets, has created a ton of free and paid 2D and 3D assets, all available on his website, kenny.nl. This tool can be bought on his itch.io page. There are two versions of this tool, a $20 basic version and a deluxe version for $40 USD, which comes with hundreds of more blocks. Now what this program is intended to do is allow someone who is say a blender maladroit such as myself, I can't use the tool for anything, to easily take these pre-built 3D blocks and build models out of them and then export those lovely creations to be able to use them with a game engine of their choice. And if you are good at using Blender, you can use this tool to kitbash together things that are a bit more complex quickly, and then export to a format that you can open in Blender and tweak even further. But I bought this to be able to make models very quickly for Smile Game Builder and RPG Developer Bakin, and I'm very happy to report that it works perfectly for that purpose. So to get started, I'm going to show you everything I can about this program and hopefully do it justice. When you first open the program, you'll be presented with this screen, this UI. It may look a little bit different because I'm in the 4K resolution and I had to scale this UI up. But we'll see this grid, which is where we will build all of our 3D blocks. Basically, this is our canvas and we can navigate this 3D space by holding down the right mouse button and dragging. You can change the position of your camera. You can select objects by clicking and dragging with the left mouse button, although there are no objects to select at this time, so nothing happened. You can click and drag with the middle mouse button to pan your camera around, and you can zoom your camera in and out using the scroll wheel. There are additional controls down at the bottom of the screen, as well as friendly tooltips. To explain the rest of these controls, I'm going to go ahead and select one of the default blocks, and then we'll get to looking at the different categories of blocks that this comes with. And it comes with hundreds and hundreds. So I'm in the Buildings folder right now, and I've just selected a plain block. And you'll notice that as I move my mouse around our 3D canvas, the block will snap to one of these grid squares. We've got a handy arrow on that grid square, reminding us that that's the center of the whole scene. That's where I'd like to place my block. We don't have to put it there, that's just where I'd like to start. So after we place our block, we'll be able to see the gizmo. And if we click off of the block, we can get to the gizmo again by clicking the block again. This gizmo will affect this block's translation or position on the grid, as well as the scale of any of its three dimensions. It's probably easier just to show you how this works. If we click and drag the arrow and move, we'll be able to move this block one grid space at a time in any of the three dimensions. And if we click and drag one of the squares instead, we'll be able to extrude that side of the block, stretching it out one grid square at a time. Don't worry, this is all very configurable. If we go the reverse direction, we can make it as flat as a single plane, and that might be incredibly useful for some of you. If we hold down the Q key while this is selected, we get access to the rotation gizmo, and that allows us to rotate this thing. Now you'll notice this is being rotated in 20 degree increments. That's because that's how I have it set up, but we can change that as well. All right, so you'll notice that we have a host of tools and options above, as well as the typical file edit and other menus. So we'll go over these really fast. These options allow you to quickly toggle whether to use a one tenth of a grid space when you are moving blocks. That means if you select a block and click and drag on one of the arrows, it will snap to the nearest next block. If this is toggled on, it will snap to the nearest tenth of that block. So much more precise movement with that enabled. But you may wish to turn that off if you are just trying to kit bash something together very quickly using the blocks before you get into movement. So we'll turn that off. This next control toggles the grid shape into that of a hexagon, a hexagonal grid. This might be really useful if you are trying to kit bash some models that will follow more this style of terrain in your game. We'll leave it square for now. The next settings are going to help us determine the increments of movement whenever we are placing something down for the first time. So this very first option is set to 1.0 and that means when you click a block, it will snap to the nearest grid. If you bring this down to say 0.1, then any new blocks that you select to bring into your canvas will snap to the nearest tenth of a grid. Very useful for precise movement. Changing this to any value other than 1.0 does seem to override the 1 tenth grid when moving blocks toggle, so just keep that in mind. Now that this is at 0.1, our blocks that we have already set down are also movable in those 
tenth of a grid space increments. We can also set this to something much higher than 1.0 as well. If I do 1.5 and then move a block, it'll actually move one and a half squares. We'll keep it at 1.0 for simplicity. And now I will show you rotation increments. It is currently set to 45 degrees. For this, I have to select something that's not a cube, something that's gonna look different when we rotate it. Before we place this down on the map, if we press the space key, it will rotate 45 degrees. And it'll rotate 45 degrees no matter what your rotation setting is set to. However, after you place it down, that's when your rotation setting goes into effect. So with this set to 45 degrees, we can hold Q to get access to the rotation gizmo. And when we attempt to rotate our block, it will always rotate to the nearest increment of what we have set. So 45 degrees, 90 degrees, 135, 180, and so on. If you want more control over the rotation, you can bring this all the way down to five degrees. Your rotation will then look something like this. All right, now it's time to see what the Greeble function does, and we can hold down the G key to activate that. Greeble is going to allow any block that you are attempting to place to kind of crawl on the top of any adjacent blocks. So see how the ring at the bottom of my cube here is a slightly darker color than the rest of the cube? I shouldn't say ring base. Without Greeble selected, it will remain oriented that way. But with Greeble configured on, by holding down the G key, it's going to kind of crawl onto the model that I have. That's going to be useful for things like putting wings on plane vehicles and stuff, flying vehicles, ash. And finally, you can adjust the entire Z axis placement of what you've got going on, or at least I'm referring to the vertical axis as the Z axis. It is, of course, possible to select more than one object and use these controls to rotate them incrementally, translate their position, or even extrude two objects or more at once. Okay, I feel like building a house. I'm gonna do that. Let's build a house. I'm going to navigate through the different blocks on the left-hand side of the screen by checking out the folders available in the dropdown. Now again, this is the deluxe version, so I'm not sure what all here does not come with the base version of this program, but here you can look at all of the blocks, which will give you access to 14 pages of blocks that you can then navigate using the arrow keys. And you can also search through the blocks by typing in a name in the search function. So in this case, I can search for wall and I'll find all of the walls throughout all of the folders, no matter what category they're in. But we can also drill this down to a folder of assets that we would like to use. And we also have the option to look at our recently used as well as our favorites, but we can look at aircraft, alphanumeric, animals, blasters, bricks, Buildings, castles, characters, city, dungeons, fences, foliage, golf, greebles, hexagons, mechanical, primitives, roofs, ships, swords, trains, vehicles, walls, and western. Western comes with detailed crates, mine tracks, and you can just continue stamping these down and basically make your own entire scenery to export as a model. It's easy to use the Control C and V keys to paste and just keep building out. You can also select more than one object at the same time and Control C and V to paste. Larger selections. You can press the space key while you're planning on placing down your part of a model and that'll rotate everything you have selected. And if you mess something up, you've got a limited history, so you can just hold Control and press Z to undo the last action or several actions. All right, back to my house, and then I can show you the last menus and features of the program. We're going to the Buildings tab yet again, and I'm just gonna quickly as I can kit bash this house. All right, I've got one half of a house done. I'm gonna go ahead and just copy that half of a house. Select every block, Control C, Control V, and I'll hit space. And now just like that, I've got my other half of a house done. It's a very tall, narrow house. All right, and there you have it. This is a very quirky, funky house, but it's going to do just fine. So I can show you the rest of the features this program has to offer. Now you don't just have access to placing blocks down. You can also paint the blocks. And when you click on the paint brush tab here, you can paint a surface with an existing material or you can create a new material with which to paint your surfaces. All of your surfaces do have some pre-fined materials and you can see what those are by hovering over the existing materials that will appear here after you've put down some blocks. I've got bricks dark, which is going to refer to the darker band around the square tiles and beveled tiles, the very basic building blocks, bricks, which is going to refer to this other color, stone and metal light and glass. So we can click on any of these and change them. 
Clicking on, say, the Bricks Dark material will give you a new menu with three different tabs. We've got one for color, one for texture, and one that allows you to define some custom properties, such as the scale of the material, a default gradient or unlit shader, metallicness, and glossiness. To see these effects, we'll have to actually select a texture, but just to show you, you can change the color and it will affect all of the materials out in your canvas that have that material as a property. When we select from the textures tab, we have access to stone, wood, brick, concrete, metal, nature, and patterns. And clicking on any of these will give us a menu. For concrete, there is only one, but it actually looks pretty good. It almost looks kind of like marble. It's really, really fancy, if very quirky house we've got going on here. The metal light material refers to, in this case, the trim, the frames around the doors and the windows but I'd like to change the roof. So that's gonna be the stone material for whatever reason. That's just what it's called. We can make this look like whatever we want. I'll go to the metal tab and start clicking the options there and previewing them here in the preview. We've got some really interesting textures included in the program. Just trying to see right now if any of them would look particularly good with my quirky house. I kind of like this one here, shack. There's also steel and stripes. I think the stripes looks a little bit more refined than the other options, so I'm going to keep that one. And now I'll click on this third tab, and we can change the scale of the texture that's being used on the model. And that changes in real time, so you can kind of see the effect of changing the scale. You may wish to do this to optimize the look of your model. We can change the shader from default gradient or to unlit. If we change it to gradient, we can change the height and opacity. And if we change it to default, we can change the metallicness and the glossiness as I showed you earlier. The metallicness can range from zero to one. It's a pretty standard 3D property for materials as is glossiness. A glossiness of one is extremely glossy. It gives us a beautiful reflection. I don't know how that will look in the engines that I'm planning to use this model in though. Well, I'm pretty much done with the model itself. I guess I could change the overall color of the walls. And now I can show you the menus. You've got your typical file menu with new, open, merge, save, save as, export sprite, and export model. And we'll be using the export model function shortly. The edit menu with the typical undo, paste, but also move to floor and move to center options. You can lock and unlock various blocks or models, and you can change your preferences here as well. Preferences include the ability to toggle the auto save backup and display hints. I'm gonna leave those on. You can clear the thumbnail cache from here and reset preferences as well. The eyeball tab allows you to change the look of your workspace. You can have a light workspace, space, sky, sunset, and that will actually change the preview of what anything glossy in the canvas is reflecting as well. Gosh, that's pretty. You can turn the anti-aliasing from high to medium to low to off completely. You can toggle ambient occlusion, shadows, and V-Sync, and you can change the scale of the UI and the gizmo. Since I'm running at 4K, I have these scaled up to twice their size. They don't go any higher, but if I didn't, the UI would be this small. That's a lie, it would be this small. This is the 1.0 scale. 2.0 is necessary for me. The last tab allows us to change the opacity and select through the grid. The materials tab allows you to assign a new material, remove a material, or purge unused materials. From blocks, you can load a collection, which by the way, you can make your own new blocks. I think I said that already. For this program and on itch.io, there are tons of collections of blocks made for this program. So definitely check that out if you're still on the fence about with it to purchase this. And you can open your customs folder from here. You can open Lua scripts from here and you can access the help files. We've got documentation, tutorials, links to the community and about. Using the script menu and then clicking open Lua, you can navigate to your scripts folder that comes with Asset Forge. We've got three Lua scripts here, a building generator, a car generator, and a golf generator. Clicking on the building generator will generate a random building using the assets included. It will do this intelligently. It'll place windows and balconies where they're supposed to go, HVAC units on top. The only thing I found missing was a door and we can do that ourselves. It'll be random every time. So generate lots of buildings and see what works for you. We can also use the car generator generator to generate car using the assets in the car folder. Here's another example. It's slightly different. Another one. We can hit the repeat file or just the F5 key to make the script run over and over without having to select it. And we can finally run the golf generator. This will create a mini golf course intelligently as well, randomly using the assets in the golf folder. This thing is incredible. And if this was an is it worth it video, I would have to say yes. I don't regret this purchase at all. So I'm ready to export this model. 
and show you what kind of export options we have. So here is our export menu and we can choose from any of the presets, default, Blender, Godot, 3D printing, Unity, or Unreal. Now all this does is set the rest of these options to a different preset. We can easily change any of these, so I'll just show you all of them. Uh, so for format, we have FBX, Object, DAE files, GLTF, and STL for 3D printing. You can export the selection only. You can merge the blocks, which is extremely handy. That way, with all of the blocks joined, all of the unseen faces will simply disappear and you don't have to worry about them adding to your poly count. And you can choose whether or not to generate a color map. Finally, you can just export the model. All right, I exported two versions of my house, one with a color map and one without, and imported them into this game engine. This is Smile Game Builder. Just as an example of what it might look like, the one that I exported with a color map completely overwrote the materials, which is expected. That is what it says it will do. It basically just gives you the object that you created without any of the materials on it. If you do not export with a color map, you'll get the materials. However, they did not display properly in Smile Game Builder until I made sure that every single material had a texture assigned to it. Anyway, both of these models were really, really easy to put together. And in fact, all of the models on this map were made very quickly using Asset Forge. And that's it. I hope that this answered some of your questions about Asset Forge and whether it might be right for you in your game development journey. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I'm told many of my viewers are not subscribers. I'll see you in the next video. Until next time, have a fantastic rest of your day and bye for now.